today we have wonderful guests. Uh, very busy, just opened a restaurant last week. Help me welcome Chef JJ Joseph Johnson. Oh, man, thank you so much for being here. No, thanks for having me. Um, well, first, could you just uh, explain a little bit about your upbringing and uh, how food got introduced to your life? Um, I, mean, I think it's the same. I, I tell the story all the time. I think it's the same for most of us. Somebody in our house cooked food, and we kind of fell in love with it. I, I fell in love with it at a really young age. Uh, my grandmother used to cook. Uh, I used to step on a milk crate and peel carrots and onions, or I believe I was peeling carrots and onions looking back. Yeah. Um, and she played loud salsa music. Uh, she made it fun. I didn't watch cartoons. Um, and I, was, I always was in the kitchen. Uh, was this uh, during this point, when did you decide, I want to do this for a living? I want to be a chef. I was actually in the second grade. I saw a commercial for the Culinary Institute of America when they did have commercials. And I said to my mother, my dad, that I would be a, I want to go to this culinary school. My mom kind of laughed and chuckled. Like, what do I know? I'm in the second grade. Like, what are you talking about? And as I got older and older, I always would talk about wanting to cook uh, or always was cooking uh, or challenging people's food. Like, if I knew what it was supposed to taste like. And my mom started to instill when I was probably like in the 10, 10 years old, 11 years old, that I should be a doctor or a politician or a teacher, um, something a little bit more respectable uh, than a chef. But also, um, black people have been cooking their whole life, so why do you want to cook? Sure. Just being a chef is not quite what it is now in terms of respectability. Um, when you were talking... As a, as a profession, I would say. Yeah, I mean, for, for myself, I think chefs are superheroes. Um, but if you, I mean, if you look at like Mashama Bailey's uh, mm. Chef's Table series, right, she had the same conversation with her parents. Mm. And she was a personal chef in the Hamptons, making all this money. Her mom and her dad said, you better quit your job. And she was like, well, why? I'm cooking amazing food. I'm making amazing money. And they, so it, there's still a stigma regardless of what, what we do, I think my mom is probably more happy that I'm a business owner mm -hmm. and I'm employing people versus that I'm cooking food of the African diaspora. Mm, okay. um, she, my parents come in support, uh, but I would say uh, those are the conversations you have to have, you have in your household before you go to culinary school. Um, and I know that a lot of my friends that are not just African American, but like are Korean or Chinese, um, their parents were migrants. They came here, they opened up a restaurant, and they're like, well, I opened this restaurant. Mm -hmm. It was not for you to cook. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So um, you spoke about wanting to go to CIA. You actually attended the CIA. Um, how, did that, how did that experience set you up going there? I would do it again. Mm. Uh, I went to CIA, graduated with my, bat with my associates in 2004, took a year off, and went back promised my mom I would get my bachelor's. Mm. Went back and graduated bachelor's 07. I met amazing people along the way. Uh, I learned the flow of a kitchen. I grew up in the Poconos. Uh, there wasn't a lot of kitchens to truly work in. I worked in a country club that I used to ride my bike to. Um, There's like one place mm. called Sky Top Lodge that I found out as I got older that I worked in that was like a really beautiful kitchen and put out really good food. Uh, but I wasn't gonna work in like Red Lobster or Applebee's or Outback Steakhouse. Um, and I worked in a country club with like these two drunk chefs um, mm. that I remember like taking food out of garbage cans at points as a kid and I would like call them out as a dishwasher <laughs> and they wind up like firing me. But you know, that was, those are the things in these types of places in America. So CIA kind of helped me understand the flow of a kitchen, mm. um, instilled really good values uh, in me, but I only learned how to cook really like two styles of food, French and Italian. Sure, sure. So um, after leaving the CIA and beginning your career, in the early stages, was diversity something you were very aware of in terms of people of color or women in higher up positions? 
So I, this might sound really crazy. Like I don't really, see, I don't see color. Like when I hire somebody, I'm gonna take a couple of steps. I'm gonna go forward in life. Like when I hire somebody or I hang out with my friends, I look at everybody really equal. Um, we might talk about like trial, trials and tribulations and things that go on in our life, but like I don't, I never looked at like, oh, this person got hired or that person got hired because they were a white male, mm -hmm. right? Um, I worked at Tribeca Grill in one of my first kitchens and Drew's kitchen was, Drew Nipiron's kitchen was very diverse. Uh, male, women, uh, Latino, Asian, African-American. Were the, was the person at the top a white chef? Yes. Was the sous chef white? Yes. Um, but I didn't look at it. I wasn't looking at it that way because um, I was just happy to learn. And I, everybody around me was very different and in, including. Mm -hmm. um, when I left there to work in my next kitchen, was I the only person in the kitchen? Yep. When I left there to work in the next kitchen, was the only person in the kitchen? Yeah. When I say the only person, I mean, I was the only African American and the other people of color were Mexican, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I did work for Leah Cohen when she ran, ran Central Vino Tech and her kitchen was very women heavy, right? But she was a woman running a kitchen. Uh, when I went to work at Morgan Stanley, I was, this, I was a sous chef, like executive sous chef. And that kitchen had an older man that was there for probably like 35 years, Jamaican descent. Um, but what I was seeing when I was in kitchens was people weren't getting hired, like people weren't hiring the best people. Okay. People were hiring based off what they felt comfortable with. And I say now, if you really just hire the best person, we don't really ever have to have this conversation. You know, if you really go and interview somebody and look at their resume and they do a tasting or they go through the wine list or they explain the wines proper or they clear or they bust the tables really well or they have good management skills in the areas you need, you should hire them because they're qualified for the position, not because they're white, black women or other, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, they should be hired because of who they are mm. and Hopefully these conversations will help people do those things as you are a manager now or, uh, or you become an owner uh, or when you're in a space and you just see something wrong, you should probably uh, look at it and maybe talk to ownership. So I want to talk a little bit about representation because I think for many people of color or women or, or others, um, when people don't necessarily see representation, they may say to themselves, you know, maybe this, maybe this is my, my glass ceiling. Maybe moving up isn't necessarily for me in this place. Um, how, when you did not necessarily see anyone that looked like you moving up, did you kind of say to yourself, I'm going to keep moving up regardless, even if it seems like I don't necessarily fit their mold. So I worked at Morgan Stanley Executive Dining Room for about three and a half years. It's, uh, I call it like a secret dining room. Nobody knows it exists. We change our menu every day. We cook for all the CEOs, MDs on the 41st floor on, on 1585 Broadway. Literally, you can see like the whole city. Um, and the chef there was from uh, Chantrell. Mm -hmm. And Zach Friedman still a really good friend of mine. And I was trying to leave the corporate sector to go back to the private sector, and I couldn't get a not even a sous chef job. And I used to think, well, maybe I can't get it because I'm in the corporate sector, going back to the private sector. And that's what people would tell me from time to time. So I would do a tasting, they would say, oh my God, it's amazing. And I would never get a call back. And I would, I would personally always reach back out and be like, hey, I didn't hear from you. Um, did the position get filled? And can you just, if you didn't hire me, it seems you didn't hire me. Can you let me know how I can get better or where I can get better and so I can then get the resources to do what I need to do? And most people would just say, oh, you worked in, you're in corporate America. I, we need something like in the private world. I'm like, but I worked in like six private restaurants before. Mm -hmm. And I was sous chefs in these restaurants or ju junior sous in these restaurants. Mm -hmm. So I started to figure out how to like 
kind of break the glass ceiling myself. So I happened to go on a cooking show at that moment, which was Rocco's dinner party. Mm. I cooked on that show. I won my episode and a gentleman named Alexander Smalls contacted me mm -hmm. and talked about this restaurant called The Cecil, uh, which is my claim to fame, uh, that he and I started to develop recipes to uh, start developing recipes for this restaurant. But he never offered me a job when I started developing the recipes. Like I used to be in his house and I didn't have a job yet. Like I didn't get an offer letter. Mm. And uh, the girl I was dating at the time was like, you're crazy. Like you're wasting your time going to this dude's house and he's not even giving you a job that I was just talking about. It. And I was like, well, I mean, nobody else is giving me a job. So, what, I mean, this is the closest right. thing I have. Yeah. And I kind of let it, I left it like in God's hands and it all worked out. He offered me, offered me a position. Mm -hmm. He didn't care that I never was a CDC before. He didn't care that I wasn't an executive chef. He just felt like it was right. Mm -hmm. um, and I built a team around me, which I thought were the right puzzle pieces. Mm -hmm. And the Cecil went for five years and it was really great. But I wouldn't have... I wouldn't be where I am without that person giving me a chance. Mm. And it just happened to be a black man. Mm. Um, I'm not sure that anybody else at that moment in my life would have given me that chance. I mean, like, I went to Ghana and Cook. Tao mm. Group offered me a sous chef position. Mm. And uh, Ralph, who's a corporate chef of Tao, we go back and forth about this all the time when I see him. And he's like, wow, like, you have two ways in the road. You went to Ghana or you could have worked at Arlington Club mm. and been a sous chef. Where, you know, like, yeah. if I would have went this way, where would I be? It only felt right to go this way. And sometimes you just have to take a risk. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of people of color and a lot of women are scared or don't know if they take this risk, what's going to happen, mm. right? You're really like, well, I have a job. I need this money. It's really good. I work for this really good, this really good hospitality group, and they have 35 restaurants, and they should promote me. Or I should be promoted. And you, you kind of give yourself your own glass ceiling or they're telling you, like, we got you, we got you, and then they don't have you because at the end of the day, uh, people run a business to make sure they stay in business. Sure. So I guess piggybacking off of when you were at uh, Cecil's and you were at the Chef's Club and you had your residency there and you had a very distinctive, a very authentic you approach to it when you talking about the music, talking about um, the food you're doing. Was there any type of, because it seems to be a, a threat of fearlessness in terms of your, your belief in you and what you were doing. Was there any type of trepidation about having a continuous list of hip hop playing at a fine dining establishment? with your food? I got tired of my friends playing hip hop in their restaurants and people giving them credit. Like, <laughs> like let's take the reverse. Like if I was yeah. playing Nirvana and Green Day in my mm -hmm. restaurant, right? One of my friends would come to me and be like, hey bro, why are you playing Nirvana or Green Day? Mm -hmm. Like they would literally say that. And mm -hmm. I got tired of walking into restaurants and then playing hip hop and not really having a belief on why they're playing hip hop, mm -hmm. right? So I said, what was, the greatest, what was the greatest era for me personally for hip hop was 90s, hip, the 90s. And I call it like the best times in life. You can remember where you were. Mm -hmm. Like I remember I was driving like a 1996 Honda Accord and this, this was playing and this is where I was. Yeah. Uh, but it also like, it also was a, a movement. Like 90s hip hop was a movement of culture mm -hmm. uh, to prove that this music would be around forever and now it's a billion dollar business. Mm. So if, if, any, if, I'm gonna, if somebody's gonna embrace it, I was, I'm going to embrace it. Yeah. And I'm gonna tell you, and I'm gonna put these specific songs that represent something in musical history mm. to the culture, not just because I like hip hop. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why you hear a lot of Diddy, you hear a lot of Mariah, you hear, you hear Usher, you hear all these, these young kids at that moment that they had no fear, mm. uh, they believed in themselves. It was like they put up, they, like they, the last thousand dollars they put on black on the crap table, like hoping it was gonna hit black. Yeah, yeah. And um, 
And, and if, if you really want to make impact, you have to really believe in yourself and make others believe in you. Um, and Chef's Club was my first time Cecil closed. Wasn't the greatest uh, closure, like my first closure as like an employee. Mm -hmm. um, had no control and um, I was, you know, I had a friend who has like the most amazing jobs in the world. He used to be Barack Obama's uh, brand, like brand ambassador who, right? Like who, everybody wants that job. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he would always say like, I was like, how did you get that job? And he's like, listen, sometimes you have to call a friend. Mm. Like you literally have to pick up the phone and call a friend and be like, hey man, or hey, like I need this. Like, can you help me? And everybody has a friend in a place that really can help you. And I picked up the phone and called Aaron Arisby, who was like the booker at Chef's Club, and was like, hey, I've been raising money for this fast casual. I'm not really raising a lot of it. I'm struggling. Do you think I can do it at Chef's Club counter, a pop-up around rice? And he was like, nobody ever wants to cook at Chef's Club counter. Mm. And I was like, well, I want to cook at Chef's Club counter. Like, yeah. I don't care what everybody else wants to do. And I did my tasting with Stefan, the owner. It was probably my worst tasting ever. <laughs> um, he didn't, at the end, he was like, I'll get back to you. And it just happened that his wife walked in. And she was like, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. I like cooked something, gave it to her. She like, she like ate and she's like, so when is this guy, he's coming here? Oh man. And he was like, yeah, he's coming, yeah. Right. <laughs> That's a stand. And then, and then at that moment, the next day, we started planning for Chef's Club Counter and I literally made no money on the deal. I literally took whatever money I had um, and said, I'll pay for the marketing aspect of it if you make sure we have everything because you've never done it here before. And um, we sold out three nights in a row. And on the third night, uh, he was like, well, I have nobody for Chef's Club. Would you be willing to do Chef's Club in our new residency program mm. for three weeks? I was like, I don't really want to do full service right now. I'm focused on this fast casual, fast casual. And Aaron was like, well, what you got to lose? Like, you, you're not doing anything else. Right, let's do it. And we did it. Three weeks turned into three months. And um, mm -hmm. I met some investors along the way and got some money for field trip. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was kind of my first birth of, like, who JJ is out on his own. Mm -hmm. uh, very unapologetic. So it's almost, almost like if... if she didn't come along and not necessarily co-sign and say like, hey, this is really good. What are you talking about? Get this guy in here. I would have went back and emailed and set up a second meeting and <laughs> knocked on his door and Kept kind going. of figured it out to keep going. Mm. I'm sure it would have happened. Maybe mm. it wouldn't have happened in two weeks from then. Mm. Uh, but you, I mean, you truly, like people, African-Americans and women truly have the odds against them, right? Mm. And, and when I say that, like, my parents are true blue collar. My mom's a school teacher. My dad's a bookkeeper. When I was raising money, I couldn't go to, like, my mom and be like, hey, mom, can I get 25000 mm. She's yeah. like, 25000 for what? I mean, I asked my parents to, like, refinance their home. My mom's like, I have three more years on my mortgage. I'm not refinancing shit. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. You figure it out. Yeah. Right? So, like... And, not, and, and I used to be like, I used to be that kid that used to be mad at parents, at kids' parents that set them up for success, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because they had access. Now I have kids, and I'm trying to set my kids up for success, right? I'm trying to make sure that they have a piggy bank or they have access to certain things. Mm -hmm. And I feel like my parents set me up for that, but without being fearless, without taking no for an answer, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't have field trip. I raised a certain amount of money. I even. I mean, I went to Danny and and RC and asked them to fund, mm -hmm. and they said, "Well, that's not part of our model. We don't. Uh, we we need to see proof of concepts first. And I said, "Well, you need to diversify. Mm -hmm. You don't have any diverse things underneath your portfolio. So like, there's always a way, mm -hmm. right? You have to think about who you're talking to at the certain times." Mm -hmm. um, and they said, don't worry, JJ, we're always going to support you. And I said, well, I need, I need a check. <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't need no love letters. Yeah. So 
And you, as for myself, as an entrepreneur now, as a founder, I wear different hats every day. Yeah. Um, I probably wish I was cooking more sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, but I know that I'm employing people. Mm -hmm. um, and most people that are coming to me are of color. Mm -hmm. It's very odd for me. It's very odd that I very rarely, inter I very rarely will interview a white man. Mm -hmm. I can probably tell you how many times I interview a white man mm -hmm. at all the restaurants I've been at from the time at the Cecil to, to today. And we, I go back collectively and say, why is that? Mm -hmm. Because the same people that are applying for me that are of color are the same people that are applying to my peers' restaurants. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, is the, is the food intimidating? Do they feel like there's not a place for them? Like, like I, I switch it, mm -hmm. right? It's like, is, Am I not being inclusive? Yeah. Um, but we can never figure out why. And we post it on every, on every place. We use the same places that everybody else posts. But, mm -hmm. um, but I do get a good group of people of color that I think or I believe feel that the places I am is a very safe space for them. And they'll mm -hmm. be able to come up through me because they have some type of opportunity hmm. or to show their talent or wisdom. Do you, do you think maybe because it's not necessarily a, a defined, um, maybe a defined space or defined idea of what fine dining and kind of a, an authentic African-American experience translate on a resume in terms of when you come across different cooks and say, oh, I worked here, I worked here, and I work here, but if they necessarily put a restaurant that maybe is run by a black chef and has a mostly diverse staff, it doesn't quite have the impact on their resume they think it would, regardless of the quality of the cooking done at that restaurant. I mean, that's really, like if I think right now of like the best restaurants in America, in my, my opinion, are ran by people of color, Nightshade. Mm. Chinese woman, uh, June Baby, El Guardo, Black Man, mm. um, Kith and Ken, Kith and King, yeah. Kwame, right? Yeah. Uh, Mashamba Bailey, Nina Compton, uh, Amy, like people that have really strong point of views in their kitchen. Mm. Mashamba Bailey, in particular, like I've really gotten to know her recently, um, and and her approach. To, to, the, to cooking and where she is located is very like unapologetic and also just means a lot to her. Mm. Uh, and she's pulling from like inspiration of people that look like her, like Edna Lewis, like that's her inspiration. She never met Edna, she's reading a book mm. and that's where she's pulling her inspiration from and feels like she doesn't want to let this woman down. Mm. Um, and so I don't know, I mean, I think a lot of it is fear Think of a lot of it is, why should I be here? Um, or maybe the food just doesn't talk to everybody. Um, and I would say that's sad because a lot of food that we cook is based on history. Um, and you've eaten it somewhere or you've tasted it somewhere and somebody's told you it belonged here but it really didn't, it's not from here, it's really from here. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I blame that on a lot of food writers. Like, I, like Pete Wells wrote about a, a Emma, uh, Emma Squared or one of the pizza spots. And it was like, they're from Rhode Island. And they have peri-peri sauce. And the reason why they have peri-peri sauce is because they're from Rhode Island. No, the reason why mm -hmm. they have peri-peri sauce, yeah, they're from Rhode Island. But there's a Portuguese influence in Rhode Island, right? And that's why they know how to make peri-peri mm -hmm. sauce. Like, go a little bit deeper and tell the story so people can understand mm -hmm. why certain things. And the Portuguese have been influenced by the West Africans who have peri-peri sauce mm -hmm. just because of slavery happened. Like some things you sure, just have to sure. talk about. Um, and I think that will help people be more inclusive or more diverse or even cook some of those items on their menu and feel like it's okay, sure. but, t but they'll talk about it properly. I'll say, you know, a, a chef JJ experience is is more than a meal. It's, it's very much a history lesson. And could you speak a little bit about how, when you took a trip to Ghana, how those kind of two weeks really reinforced that for you? 
Uh, yeah, so I used to, as a young kid, I was like, I will never travel internationally. I don't need to cook internationally. I'm in New York. You can get any type of food here. Um, Alexander in the process said, hey, do you want to come to Ghana for two months and cook? Uh, and I was like, yeah, why not? Um, I got all the vaccines and my visa. My mom thought I was crazy. Mm. Um, and most of my peers now, like as I'm older, would say, I went to Ghana and I found myself because I went to visit the slave castles and the moments I went through the slave castles, I started to find out who I was. Mm. I happened to find myself through food. I started like smelling aromas and tasting things and it would bring me back to these moments I didn't really know where they came from, but I really, I'm a baby of the African diaspora. My dad's African American, my mom's West Indian and Puerto Rican from Barbados, my grandfather's from Barbados. And when I started looking at where people migrated to through forced migration, th chosen migration, they were made up of these places, like Puerto Rico is made up of the Afro, like Afro Puerto Ricans are made up from people that come from Ghana and Nigeria that have touched Jamaica and have fallen in this place. And Barbados is made up of British and India uh, and Afro, right? Mm -hmm. And you can try to chase, trace these food elements and spices to certain places in the world. Um, and when I was eating things, I would go back, these moments were taking me back to my grandmother's kitchen of like being on the stoop or tasting this broth or smelling these spices. Uh, and at that moment when I left Ghana, I realized like, okay, I'm not cooking risotto anymore. I know what I'm gonna cook now. And I started reading encyclopedias. I started doing like massive research of like everywhere where there was an Afro coast in the world. And I would, re I would study those areas. So I would look at like the Afro coast of Peru. I would look at, uh, I would look at like Jamaica Chinese. I would look at Bayesian Indians. I would look at the Afro coast of Colombia and Brazil. Um, I would look at Portugal and like how it's made up and like the food that went through there. And then that's how I, that's how I started building dishes. Um, because it wasn't really a reference point of like, who, like where could I go eat mm -hmm. um, to taste this food or use it as a reference except for Ghana. After I left Ghana, it was like I have to go back or I have to kind of go to the Caribbean. Now I know I can go to Houston because Houston has like the largest Nigerian population. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I started actually eating a lot in Chinatown because of like fermented vegetables and f fermentation and smoky. Those are, the, those are the cooking techniques that you would see in Ghana. A lot of pickling, a lot of smokiness, um, mm -hmm. a lot of seafood. Uh, so I would try to use reference points of, of areas and also Ghana have like, has a lot of Chinese that live there. So experiencing and trying to understand these flavors and tying them back to childhood was really big for me. Um, hopefully this year I will take a trip back to West Africa and I'm gonna do Nigeria. I'm gonna cook in Nigeria. Uh, and then I'm gonna do Senegal, back to Ghana to see some homies and then fly, go to Morocco and then come home. Light trip. Uh, it won't be light. Uh, have to, <laughs> it'll be at least like 10 days, yeah, 10, to, 10 to 15 days. You, you just opened Field Trip. Mm -hmm. Would you mind explaining a little bit about Field Trip and kind of so field, how you got there? Field Trip invokes fun. Um, it is a rice bowl shop. Uh, all the rices come from a specific place in the world. Uh, they're the granddaddy or grandma grains or heirloom grains that fueled these communities. 90% of the rices are freshly milled. None of the rices are bleached or enriched. All the rices we eat on the shelf, except for like two brands that are on the shelf, are bleached and enriched. Most of the time enrichment means like it's good for us, but they, when they enrich rice, they pull all the nutritional factors all out of it, and then they put, the, they put it back in. Um, so we all are eating really bad rice. So I'm taking what I consider the most disrespected item and trying to get respect back in like a ramen noodle shop form. So you come in, order from the counter, uh, you can get black China rice, Carolina gold, Texas brown, Lao sticky, and two aged uh, basmati. And like real basmati rice, not texmati. Um, texmati? Yeah, yeah all, mostly all the basmati rice we, 
re-eat in America comes from Texas. The reason why they call it basmati is because the United States government won't allow like a DOC uh, on, on the packaging. Basmati mm-hmm. rice is like champagne. It can only really be grown in India. Uh, and it should be only called basmati if it's coming from India. So Glenn Roberts from Anson Mills has been my mentor on this project for about four or five years. Uh, he has told me to look at these specific kind of places. Um, I hated rice. I love rice now. Um, all the items on the menu are under $12. Uh, we even do rice milk ice cream. We have like quinoa buns, some wok vegetables. And most of the rices are cooked in a wok because everywhere I've traveled and seen rice cooked, it's always been on like a tin, in a tin pan or a copper pan. Uh, and I've been to Israel, Singapore, Ghana, India, uh, and that's where most of the influence comes from, the flavors in this, in this restaurant. But the rice, where the rice comes from, that's the dictate, like that's how we dictate what the flavor is in that bowl. Mm. You can't mix or match uh, right now. Um, yeah. We're just trying to figure, we're just trying to make sure you understand who we are. Yeah. But yeah, I buy three, of my, three out of the five bowls come directly from the rice farm. So I literally call a rice farmer. Um, he's like on a tractor. He's like, how much, how much rice you need? I'm like 600 pounds of Texas brown rice. And he mills it for me. Mm. He ships it UPS. And I have literally a rice farmer contacting me at least twice a month. So a rice farmer in Vermont, a duck farmer in Vermont grows like this really rare Japanese sticky rice. Mm. Who's trying to sell me rice? A Brazilian rice farmer's contacting me. The guy's from Trinidad. Uh, Dan Barber's even reached out to me about a specific rice farmer. Mm. Um, So just, I think it will help. If rice is grown properly, it will also help the environment Mm -hmm. because of water levels. Um, So yeah, come by, come by field trip. You can literally get like rosé sangria on tap for six bucks, uh, some crab pockets in a bowl. You'll spend like $24. Man. Um, And if you have any friends that live in Harlem, tell them to come all the time. Definitely. Being up in Harlem, being part of that community, um, how important is it that people who are actually, because Harlem's going through a lot of changes right now, how important is it to get people from that community working in the restaurant in like a, a very visible role? Uh, yeah, so my manager, my manager for Harlem, her name's Lorraine. She, she, my manager for Field Trip, her name's Lorraine. She, used to, she grew up in Harlem 151 in Broadway. She actually lives in East Village now. Um, wasn't planned to hire her. Like, as the manager, knowing that she was from Harlem, mm. she worked at field, we have a field trip at the US Open in, uh, last year. Um, and she was part of the team, and she kind of reached out to me, like, I'm trying to grow, I can't, I'm trying to grow into a sous chef role, nobody is giving me a shot, what do you have? And I was like, oh, let's talk, I might have something for you. Yeah. And I knew it was a big investment because she's never managed before, but I knew I would probably be at Field Trip every day, so we would be okay. Um, but yeah, we hired 11 employees. Eight out of the 11 employees are, live in Harlem. Um, even one like literally lives above the restaurant. Wow. Uh, he's really good. Is he ever late? Huh? Is he ever late? Never late. <laughs> All right. He shouldn't be late. Please don't jinx, please don't jinx it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think hiring from communities, so like in that corridor I'm in is the h- highest unemployment rate in New York City. Mm. Um, so I think for 11 jobs, we interview like 165 people, or 10 jobs, 165 people, a lot of people. Mm. Uh, and we were just looking to hire the best people and a lot of them happen to live in Harlem. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's also our initiative to like, if we live in a corridor with an unemployment rate high, we should hire these people. Mm-hmm. Why would we turn our back on them when they, we hope that they would be the ones eating in our restaurant? Um, so for me, hiring is, is big, but opening a field trip, which is bigger, is hoping that the old community will eat in the restaurant, mm. right? Because, and I get misquoted for this a lot recently, is Shake Shack, Chipotle, Sweet Green all come to these communities after. They never go to these communities first because they have to expand, right? 
VC companies are getting money from or public, they have to expand into these places because there's nowhere else to go. Then when they go to these markets, they're like, whoa, we're doing really well in this market. Mm. So like Pret just opened up next to Columbia. I know a managing partner. They're like, our numbers in Columbia actually beat our numbers in like uh, 47th Street. How is that possible? Like the density is high. It's a working class density. So we, so my goal was like, well, if I can have my first fast casual, I should be in a community that uplifted me, made me who I am today. And hopefully they will come and eat here three to four times a week and order off a of delivery. Um, and then if it works here, I can plug and play this into other markets that look like this, Brooklyn, Queens, uh, the Bronx, Oakland, uh, through a growth plan. Uh, some people might say that it's too healthy for a community like this. Um, I don't believe that. I see, I see like really big dudes eating vegan bowls, yeah. right? And asking how much sugar is in our sweet tea. Like people are very conscious of what they're eating. And I feel like the African-American community has to be conscious now because of diabetes and high cholesterol and high blood pressure. And hopefully Field Trip can allow them to eat that way and the rice they're eating is really good for them. Like, you don't see Carolina gold rice for 11 bucks. You mm. eat Carolina gold rice in like Sean Brock's restaurant, it's like $32, mm. you know? Or <clears throat> any of these rices you would see for a lot of money. Mm. Uh, or like our crab pockets have real crab meat in it and it's $7.95 or $8.95. Mm. Um, so it, we're, not doing the, we're not doing this based off of small numbers. We're hoping to do this off of big numbers. and getting 250 or more people in a day. See, we're aware that a lot of, particularly in the African-American community, there are a lot of what are called food deserts where the only food people really have access to is perhaps like a, like a Kennedy, well, Kennedy fried chicken or a bodega, something like that. When McDonald's, about, Popeyes. Yeah, all the usual suspects. Um, when you're talking about expanding and growing, are these communities, areas that you're looking to grow in and offer the type of food, the healthy food that you're, uh, that you're doing in these type of communities? Yeah, I mean, um, when you look at it from a business model, right, like I think Midtown density rate is like 8% density of Midtown eat out lunch or something like that, I think that's the number. And there's like 40 quick service restaurants and they're all fighting for the same density, mm -hmm. right? So you probably get like, I think Sweet Green will probably get like 2% of that if Shake Shack's there, they'll get like three and a half percent of that, like at that lunchtime. Mm -hmm. And then everybody else is kind of fighting. Why would I put myself in fight with those guys? That's just stupid. Mm. Right? They already have a cult following. Yeah. So on the reverse, a lot of the working class live and work in these areas and they eat sweet green or try to. They eat Shake Shack, they eat Little Beat. But when they come home, they don't have that option, yeah. but they want that option. Mm -hmm. Why the bodegas now have the salad section, right? Sure. Sure. Because they've really realized that people want it, or not that people want it, they're telling them to get it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been the biggest thing is that people come in and are like, oh my God, now I can just get this here. Like I don't need to get, I don't need to get it downtown and take it home, yeah. I'm just gonna get it here. Mm -hmm. And I know who actually owns it, and they look like me, mm -hmm. and I can talk to you, um, so yeah, I mean, that's a big, like, there's always a big picture goal, sure, uh, but we sure. need one community to really, uh, get behind us. Um, it's all going to start in Harlem. Yeah. I mean, we're right there, right in front of the 116th train, 116th train on the two and the three line. Mm -hmm. Uh, my partner lives three blocks away, Samantha Davis and, um, uh, I think she got a little irritated with me this morning and was like, hey, can you let the maintenance guy in? Can you do this? And she's like, I need a day off. But then I was like, maybe I should give that kid that lives above me a key. Hey. Right? And then there he can just go open the door there it and goes. then open the gate and then close the gate. Like, wait, 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 he's not going to rob anything. There's nothing to rob. I know so, where you live. And I'm I know where you live. Yeah, right. I'm coming for it. I'm just going upstairs. I'm just going to knock on your door. <laughs> um, and I think that's a plus when you have some, when you have staff in the community, you know, like you can, you have, you can rely on them yeah. um, and go there. But no, field trip has been, a, is, a, is my love story. And um, well, yeah. I hope that it can grow uh, in, in years to come.
I do want to get to uh, audience questions. If you have questions, get them fired up, ready to go. But before we get to that, I, I do want to ask, particularly because you're doing so much in, you're so ambitious, how do you balance that? How do you go about, do you, you specifically schedule in, this is family time, I'm putting the phone down, I'm not involved with the business, I'm just here with my family, I'm recharging my battery. Is that something you have to consciously detach from work to find that balance? So I don't, I don't use, like the word ambitious doesn't, I, that doesn't exist in the dictionary to me. Okay. Um, like these things are like what I call the normal day in the office, mm. right? So normal day in the office is my kids today woke up, I have twins, boy and a girl. They woke up at 6.30 a.m. I have no clue why they woke up at 6.30 a.m., but I'm with my kids in the morning from the time they wake up to 10.30, my nanny comes. Um, and I probably spend a good amount of time with my children and my, me, my wife, and my children. Do I spend a lot of time with me and my wife? No, that's an area that I need to work on. Mm. Um, but when you look at opportunities and you look at growth and you look at life, I think for a person of color, you don't get many opportunities. So you take them when you get them. And you just don't know when they're going to fall because that's just the way of life. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, and I also look at every opportunity that I'm able to get that I'm also able to employ people or keep people employed. Um, and that's, I would say, more of the weight on my shoulders um, than anything that I do because there's people that are truly relying on, the J on JJ or the JJ brand uh, to move forward in life and grow in the business. It's a small team. Um, but no, I mean, I really feel like I just got started. I was very fortunate to be a chef in a kitchen. I got a lot of recognition. Most chefs in kitchens don't get that much recognition. Um, and I've really been out on my own operating for two years now. Um, and I, I will look I, every now that this will be like uh, the second year, I look back and I look at all partnership deals I have and some partners I might have in the past might not be the right partners to move forward with. Mm. Um, and I mean that like everywhere. My landlord might not be the right partner because I might outgrow my apartment. So I might need to look to, you know, you have to look back on your life to see where you're working, your environment, who you're around, who your team is. And your team could just be your wife, your girlfriend, your partner, your team could be, you talk to your mom every day or your dad, right? Those are all team members. Um, and I'm, I'm fortunate to have a support system where um, I have a good mother-in-law that can come into New York City. Um, I can have my parents come, right? I have, uh, Aunt Jeannie might not show up on time, but I can call Aunt Jeannie and she could come yeah. for a late night. So there are these components that you have to have when they really say uh, a village, what is it, like a village to raise to, to raise your children or something? Yeah, it takes Some, a village to raise a child. Take a village to raise a child. It actually takes a village to 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 raise your to grow your business or to be in your business. Um, and I'm fortunate to have team members or infrastructure that allows me to do new projects. Okay. Well, if anybody in the audience has questions, raise your hand. I'll get to as many people as possible. Anybody? Yes. Um, when you talk about not seeing many people uh, in the kitchen, or just to form diversity in general, as you move forward, not sure in the financing realm, can you talk about um, procuring financing and partnerships and what are maybe some obstacles if you have seen them as a person of color and getting that to that next level with the ownership? Yeah, I mean, when I first started raising money, I didn't know who to ask for money. You literally have to ask everybody. And I mean that, like start with your person who does your taxes, talk to your dentist. Like your dentist literally hears everybody's story and they know who has money, who doesn't have money. Ask your doctor, like ask people that are around a lot of people and sometimes your doctor or your dentist or your accountant will, or your person who does your taxes will either say, call this person, they're my friend and they're an investor. Or if you have a lawyer, right, or the family lawyer, um, Talk to them. I mean, I literally raised probably $50,000 at a wedding in a pool drinking pina coladas at my best friend's wedding. And a friend that we both knew, she's like, well, what are you doing next? I'm like, well, I'm raising money. 
And she's like, well, how much money are you raising? And I'm like, well, I'm looking for 25,000 intervals. And she was like, oh, can you send me the plan? I was like, you invest? She was like, yeah, me and my husband, we've been thinking about investing. So, I mean, if I'm going to invest my first investment, if I lose, I'll lose with you. And I was like, okay. I literally went back to my room, pulled my laptop out, and sent them the deck right then and there. They read it on the plane home, and two weeks later, they wrote a check. So, like, you have to really embrace it. You have to really talk about it. Every investor is different. Um, but I, I would say a couple of things you need is, like, you need a deck with pictures and and concept, what the concept is, location. could be a map with a bunch of different locations. And then you really need a projection, like that magical projection. And if somebody's really smart, they hand, if they're giving you money, they're handing their projections over to their numbers person and they're gonna go through it. And then they're, they're gonna come back with questions. But at least you can give them what, you, what it feels like and then what the numbers look like. And they know they're just investing on hypothetical until you get the first concept and then it's a proof of concept then it's a little different anybody else and you said and how diverse is it like oh, from a diversity that, that, that answers the, the bit, but i didn't know if you faced any obstacles or that you could identify uh, yeah i mean my peers raised my my peers raised three times the amount of money than i've raised to open restaurants in the same time i was raising money not be, I, I don't want to say because of color I want to say because of access, okay. right? Like, and a lot of them, I use I use an example. PJ from Scampi worked for Michael White, right? Michael White opened his Rolodex up to him, and said, "Oh yeah, call Bobby, Jim, Jose. They'll give you money." And like, they, he had that he had that access. Plus, he had family too that was able to help him out with investments too. But he had somebody that literally was pointing him in the, in the right direction, or like James. James that has Crown Shy, that worked at EMP, right? Like, Will, Will and Daniel went to meetings and said, don't worry, this guy's good, mm. right? So if you have Daniel Hum and Will Goodere, and what, what you gonna say as a big development company? No, <laughs> this guy's fine, don't worry, we'll make, we'll, we'll make sure. So like, he had access. Yeah, so you have to- Access is a form of comfortability, which comfortability, think of perfection. For people who would apply to work here, it's still boil down to, be it intentional or unintentional, uh, people's comfortability around color and race or sex or diversity is not the way. Yeah, I mean, I would say my biggest thing is I work for Richard Parsons, right? One of the most powerful black men in the world. Um, and when I first started raising money, they all asked me if Richard Parsons was going to be an investor. I said originally he was going to be, and then he pulled out for what personal reasons that he had. Um, and that probably hurt me in the beginning. Um, but after a while, you know, I got a letter from him to say that, you know, I think JJ would be an amazing owner and operator, and I give him all my goodwill. Like, you have to really think how to get around it. So if people are asking you this question, like you have this signed letter from this person, then you, you're, you're good to go. But every investor in every situation is truly different. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you, you talked about bringing in the best, looking for who the best people are, um, something that I think we're trying to I mean, USGH has tons of restaurants. You have to look at the top, right? Like, how diverse is the top? How diverse is every chef and manager, right? Like, that's the real question, you know? Like, how diverse is it at the top? And then it's like, when they really do say the trickle-down effect, it really does work in some, bi in some business. And then it trickles down, you know? So, like, how many women are leading? How many men of color are leading? How many women of color are leading? Um, and then how does that trickle down? Because when people come to work, they want to see somebody that looks like them so that when they do have an issue, that's who you're going to go to. Like, if women in my kitchen have an issue, they're not coming to me. They're going to Samantha Davis, right? And Samantha's then saying to me, then Samantha's coming to me saying, hey, you got an issue. 
And I'm like, well, what's the issue, Samantha? And why didn't that person just come to me? And she'd be like, come on, JJ. Right? <laughs> like, let's just get real here. Like, they mm-hmm. feel comfortable speaking to me. I'm a woman. They're a woman. But they know I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to be real with you. And then we're going to figure it out together. And I think that's just what it comes down to in, 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 that, in that regard. I think also in another regard, like, I use a, a gentleman, for example, like a, a porter, Matthew. Like, Matthew was a porter that was locked up for how, mu- month, for how much time, I don't know. And what he did, he wouldn't tell me. And I said, OK, I understand. So I don't want to know, because I don't want to judge you. And I moved him from an overnight porter to a dishwasher. And we wound up firing him, because he couldn't get along with people. But that was really bad management. Because Matthew been incarcerated for 15, 10 to 15 years. Of course he doesn't know how to get along with people. He hasn't been around people in a social setting. Why he's asking for an overnight porter job. Like he's being smart. So you might want to move some people up, but some conversations people are just like, hey, I'm Matthew and I just want to be an overnight porter. Yeah, I'll take the extra two. Can I get the extra $2 here? And I'll make sure the place is extra clean. And some other people is just conversation. Like, what are your goals? How are you trying to get there? The same way, and that's why I go back to like, everybody has to just get treated the same way. You have to have those initial conversations with everybody. Some people you'll retain for one year, which sucks. Some people you'll retain for five years or 10 years, which is amazing. But you have to show them a growth pattern. You have to show them how to get there, especially when you're a big business. When you're a small business, sometimes it's hard. Everybody wears a bunch of different hats. and I, what I try to say to a lot of my team members are, you will get exposed to a lot of different partners and in industries because you work with me. And I don't expect for you to be in this role with me for the rest of your life, or maybe not even next year because I might not have the growth, but my goal is to help you grow, right? So sometimes you're just picking up the phone to a peer and saying, are you looking for a sous chef? I have a sous chef. And most of the time, they're looking for a sous chef. Maybe not. Like I, I talked to Leah Cohen last night. Are you looking for a sous chef? She was like, actually, I'm opening a new restaurant. I'm taking my CDC, and I'll need a sous chef in two weeks. Do you have somebody? Send them my way. Like, it's just, you just have to have those conversations when you're at, high, when you're at the high level. Um, and I don't know where you work, but it just in, in between the organization, like from chef to chef or manager to manager or psalm to psalm, um, I have this rock star here. I think they, or they're not being a rock star here, but I think they might work better underneath you because of your management spot style. Because we all have different management styles. Hmm. I hope that answers your question. Sure. Do you have a question? That's a big question. Um, (laughs) On the initial investment end, I think a lot of people are unfamiliar with the community, so they just don't get it, right? They don't live in that, people that are investing don't live in that community. And if they are in that community investing, they're buying buildings, they are developing, they bought land. Um, if you look at Detroit, for instance, Detroit hasn't brought in a black celebrity chef to Detroit to help with the infrastructure. They brought people from other places that don't look like Detroit, right? So, um, but the local base chefs are all of color, either Chinese or black, that everybody loves their restaurants. Um, and they probably got a small business loan or their mama knew somebody that helped them out, right? Um, so I think it's very being unfamiliar. 
Uh, and I think prime example is Marcus Samuelson, right? He came into a community that people felt, or even like on a corner that nobody felt would work. And the conversation for him was, well, you're wasting your talent, you're wasting your time. Not that he was from Harlem, um, but for some reason it resonated to him. Uh, and he's gone on 10 years, and he did the work to make other people come there. Uh, and, and when I say do the work, like he cleaned up a corner, like methadone clinic is across the street. You know, he invested in security every day to make sure people were secure eating in the restaurant. He made the police department walk the streets. He made city councilmen, like, that's a lot of work. And then you look across the street and Chipotle's there now, right? Mm. So, like, Chipotle didn't come in and say, oh, we know that people are going to eat here. We're also going to help clean this up. Um, so, again, I would say unfamiliarity. And then I just think that New York is its own beast when it comes to the food game. And people have a perception of where you're supposed to open a restaurant. And that's, well, now it used to be Tribeca. But now it's like Soho, NoHo, Nomad. Um, flat iron, Gramercy, right? That's where you should have a restaurant. So if you put on your paper, you're going to open up there, I guarantee you have great conversations. Um, and then when you start to say you're going to open up in these other communities, that's when you have to really find some people that are dedicated. I have a big invest, a, a, my biggest investor de is dedicated to empowering an artist. He looks at me as an artist, but he's also has history that his family invested in a musical talent that lived in Harlem and became really big. So for him, it was like following the legacy of what his family did. Um, but yeah, sometimes like it'd take 100 people to get the investment. And then when people come, like it's not a bad thing that everybody then wants to jump on the bandwagon. It's OK. Now you can pick and choose where before you were like, well, yeah, I'll give, I'll give you that term because I need the money right now. And then later you can renegotiate or you, or you make it work. But you always will remember who said no. Right? And then you can use that as leverage down the line. I hope I answered that tenfold question. <laughs> yep, that. But then you look at the reality, too, of how things have been structured even in our school systems and how the school and prison pipeline and how all that impacts that even if you wanted somebody who was best, the reality is that there are people who are maybe unemployed around you that are going to be impacted by a business, whether you're a field trip or whether you're Chipotle or whether you're any of these other businesses that if you really want to do good in your environment and in, in the community you're in, it's not just hiring security, but it's also helping with job training. How do you see that being feasible as a business owner that also has to still answer to investors that you would still actually do any type of community good to help with unemployment in a community? I mean, I'm, when I'm hiring, I think it's easy to hire talent. It's hard to find good people, right? And the first thing I'm looking for is a good person, right? Then I don't have to worry about if you're stealing. I don't have to worry about if you're going to come to work on time, right? You're a good person. You're an honest person. I'm always looking for that first. I can always train you. Training is the biggest thing regardless if it's in a high-end establishment or a low-end a low -end establishment. We all have to be trained. It's the biggest, it's the biggest expense in the business. So um, I don't look at it that way. Like I'm reporting to investors. Like I'm training. I had to train you regardless. So, And even if you had the skill... I'm still training you the way that it needs to be done here. I'd be happy if you had some skill, but if you don't have the skill, it's okay. So I mean, like, my AM cashier worked at Hill Country. Why she probably got let go? Because she didn't know how to use the PO. She didn't know the POS system would tell her how to give change back. Nobody taught her that you can punch in $20 and it would tell you the change. She was trying to do the math herself and she, her cash register was short. Now, she didn't tell us that coming in, but on the first day, I was like, hey, girl, your cash register is $15. Why is your cash register short? And she felt comfortable enough to tell me, like, well, I don't really know how to add that well. And I was like, well, let me show you. The, the POS will show you how to do it, right? That was a mishap on us from a training level that we should have trained her with the tools because that 
that item in the that that mechanism in the POS is good for everybody to use so that there aren't any mistakes. Now her cash drop drop is the next four days her cash drop has been perfect. But she got let go later, she got let go from Hill Country because two days her cash was off and they let her go and she didn't have money to put back into the register to make up for it. It was probably way more than fifteen dollars because they're making way more money than we making. Um, and the the job the the people have to want, you're, you have to sell the service to empower them. And then they also have to want it, right? Some people just don't want it, right? If I could touch one out of every 10 person that comes through the door to eat the way we cook or to my 10 staff members that go to their friends and say, this is the place you should be working at, then I've done my job. Um, and I only can touch it those kind of ways and hope that these 10 people that I have could, if they don't grow with us, when they leave us, that they go and impact the next business. And then the next crew that comes in, we're able to, to empower them and train them. But training is the key. Um, and everybody doesn't, everybody doesn't have the luxury of getting education, even though we are in a country that everybody should be able to get it. Um, but everybody doesn't get it. Uh, I think the biggest thing is I've always will use him as an example is a gentleman named Melvin used to work for me. Nobody knew he didn't know how to read or write, but for some reason he could just, once you showed him the dish one time, two times, three times, he was able to perform. He was a dishwasher. He was able to perform. He didn't know how to write the items on the menu. He would ask the prep team to give him a list of the menu items, like the prep items and show him what it was and he would scribble something on there and he would keep that little folded paper in his wallet and he would go in and so one day we were like Melvin can you do this recipe and he couldn't read the recipe and most times in the kitchen they would make fun of you you would be like oh this guy's never going to be anything else but Melvin actually saved this one day he would he actually our wok cook went out Melvin said hey I can work the wok the whole kitchen laugh we put him on the wok station he was able to work the station Right? Because he had a skill, this memorization skill, I, genius, and he's been able to be a cook in other friends' kitchens from now on. And when they call me for a reference, I know I'm not supposed to tell them that he can't read or write, but I tell them that so that they know that they can manage him with the right expectation. Um, and he's worked in some really good places over the course of the years after leaving the Cecil. Uh, and it's just giving people an honest chance. Anybody else? Yes, in the back. Yes, hi. So let's say, for example, the company before I used to be like buying from McDonald's at dollars. Can you speak up a little bit? Sorry, I can't hear you. It's too long. So let's say like uh, me as a customer, like I'm used to buying McDonald's $2 a day, and then you are coming to the community and I buy from so how do you keep your customers in the community coming to you and you buy from so a girl came in, she goes to Stony Brook, she lives in the projects across the street, and she said, why is my chicken, my chicken bowl only has three pieces and it's $9.99, right? And I said, well, that chicken, I said, well, you've got a Stony Brook shirt on, you go to Stony Brook? She said, yeah, I go to Stony Brook. I said, well, what do you buy, what do you eat when you're there? She said, well, I love rice bowls and I get chicken and I add all these things to it and you know, my rice bowl is just a lot bigger than this for the price I pay at school. I always say, well, the school has, and I use Chipotle as an example. I said, well, Chipotle has buying power. There's 200 units, right? So the chicken they buy probably costs 59 cents a pound. The chicken that we buy costs 109 a pound. And the rice we get comes right from the farm and it's freshly milled. So I, we pay $4 a pound for rice. And I was just being transparent and honest with her. And at the end, she ate her rice bowl. Wherever she went, she came back and she said, oh my God, this was amazing. And me and my friends will come back here. And thank you for letting me know why it costs so much. Now, for me, $9.99 is amazing, right? But you're right that McDonald's and Popeye's have these items on their menu for $2.50 or $2 on the menu. And I've learned now that the reason why they do have these items on the menu, or Popeye's has a $2.50 chicken strip, is for that person. 
right? They know that everybody can't afford everything on their menu, so they put something on their menu literally for $2.50 just to capture that guest. So when that guest does have enough money, they will always come back to Popeye's because they feel like they always can afford it. Now, I wish I could figure out that $2 item on my menu, but I haven't figured it out yet. But I learned mm -hmm. that just uh, doing market research that they actually do put it. If you look at Popeye's in the airports, there's no $2.50 chicken strip. If you look at Popeye's in the hoods, there's a $2.50 chicken strip. Mm -hmm. So it's just education, and it's hard. It's not, an, it's not easy. Um, but everybody's prices are up in New York now. Like McDonald's, I think, is like eight sixty-five for a Big Mac. Um, now, and they say, well, their price is higher because they use fresh beef. No, because minimum wage went up and, um, and all those things. I think the good, I think the infrastructure we do have is some of the people that, the people that I work there live in the neighborhood, and then they're able to voice to that person saying something. They're speaking to them on the side or in the street. They see them, they know them, and they're able to say something to them, uh, which helps us out. Fingers crossed. I hope they come back. But... Those are concerns from, I would say, when you talk about like investors, right? Those are investors' concerns when they come and they eat and they go, well, JJ, do you think you're going to be able to retain a person? This person might spend their last $10 with you this week. You might only see them once a month versus three times a week. Do you think there's enough people that are going to be, the density is high, but do you think there's enough people here to eat? Yeah, please. So that comes from hiring a diverse staff, right? So like in, in most restaurants, in like full service restaurants where I have like 15 or more employees, my kitchen probably, my kitchen probably speaks like eight languages. Um, and the, 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 the staff that's speaking French is West African, right? Um, and the staff is teaching each other things or talking to each other about stuff. So everybody can't look the same. Right? Even like, if you really think about it, like for myself, like if I go to the nightclub, I want to be at the club with everybody. I don't want to be at the nightclub with all African Americans or all white people. I want to be with everybody. And that's when I, I believe I have the best times in life, right? Because somebody might be playing beer pong in the corner, right? Somebody might have a table with bottles, right? I'm, I'm just giving you a picture, right? All these different experiences are happening in the room, but you're also having these different conversations that you might agree on or disagree on that then make you go back home and research and think about stuff. Um, and that's the biggest thing in our industry that, the, that where, we, where we work, uh, the places aren't diverse enough, uh, who's writing about us isn't diverse enough, and I have big arguments with writers right now you know, everybody wants to write about people of color, but you're doing the same thing that you were doing before when you weren't writing about people of color. Like, so now you just write about people of color and you don't write about anybody that's white? That's fucked up. <laughs> right? You should just be writing about the best person. Like, whatever your article's about, you should be writing about the best person. You should be employing the best person. If you're hiring somebody and you feel uncomfortable, you have your own issue. Right? You have to have your own look in the mirror and say, should I be a manager? Um, should I be an owner? Uh, but some ownerships don't want diverse clientele. Right? Some owners don't want to hire diversely. They might say they do because they will get sued. Um, but <laughs> that's their own issues. And there's certain things that you can fix and there's certain things you just can't. Um, but I think the new... And we talked about this briefly, right? Mm -hmm. Like at, yep. at Untitled, there's, no, there's very minimal screaming in the kitchen, right? Yep. That's the new wave. We got tired of that stuff, right? Um, we also wanted to ensure people got two days off. 
We got tired of working six, seven day work weeks when we were young kids. We, you know, that mentally drains us. Um, we do it when we know it's necessary. And now the new wave is, well, who are we gonna hire and why? And is it the, not that it's the right thing, to, not that in my mind it's the right thing to do, it's the only thing to do. Um, and I think that's why the majority of my staff is women because I interview a, a lot of people at the higher level and the women are mostly the best person for the job. So, um, and some of my peers are just like, hey man, don't you feel like uncomfortable? Like your brand manager's a woman, your day-to-day -day person's a woman, your partner, culinary director's a woman, your manager, a field trip, so I'm like, no, bro, like, I don't think about that. Like, I go in, I hold you accountable, just as much as they hold me accountable, and that's it. Um, and it's just a cultural shift uh, that has to change, but I don't want to see it change the way writers are changing it, where they're just writing about one sector and forgetting about another. It should be cohesive, uh, it should be collective, and everybody should be working together. Uh, And, and, I, and I hope to see more and more of it. I mean, these, these conversations are great. It's good you guys are having these um, with different people uh, from all different sectors. It, it, makes, it will make you all better um, as you grow as individuals. Uh, like, I'm even thinking about doing employee of the month at Field Trip. Now, why would I do employee of the month? I don't know why. I've never done employee of the month ever. But in my mind, it's like, well, I'm empowering somebody. Like, I'm letting people know that you have a chance, right, to, to stay because you could potentially be employee of the month. And what do you get for employee of the month? Do you get, like, tickets to a Yankee game? Do you just get your picture on the wall? I took a survey with my team. They didn't care about the Yankee tickets. They didn't care about Metro cards. All they cared about was that their picture was on the wall and why we, chose, why we would choose them for employee of the month. And that picture would be there for 30 days and people can read about why they were chosen for employee of the month. And I think sometimes we forget about, like we think about a lot of material things and we forget about just empowering an individual. And it was a real gut check for me. And I've only been in open five days. Mm -hmm. And I literally said to my dishwasher, like, do you like them? Like, you work at Burlington Co Factory as your second job. Do they do employee of the month there? She's like, no, I wish, I mean, they do, but it's not really, like, I think it's favoritism. And then I was like, hey, I know at McDonald's, my other guy's like, work at McDonald's, they, oh yeah, employee of the month is, is the truth now, I hear, but when I was there, you know, I, you know, you should put a little blurb, like, why? I was like, you don't want Yankee tickets to play? I was like, I don't care about no Yankee tickets. And, it, and then started asking one by one, it made me say, okay, we just have to, rem we have to just remember, we have to tell people why they work here and then also let other people, let everybody else know that why they work here. Um, and that will help with retention, that will help with growth, that will help with diversity, understanding the culture. Sometimes you have to educate people on the culture. They don't know, a lot of people don't want to, a lot of people don't want to talk about the culture because it's such a bad thing that happens. And I think, and this is just me, my parents never really talked about slavery like that. They talked about it. My dad raised me as a black man and what it is like to be a black man. And I, my, I, my era is now very focused in on making sure people understand slavery occurred, this is what happened, these things were taken from us, and that everybody needs to know this because this happened and And Jewish people do it every day. They push it in your face. And us as black people hold back, hold back, hold back. And now we're starting to do the same thing. Um, and even like uh, Ghana is starting to do birthright trips. Like the, all these things are happening to educate, uh, the, to educate people with the culture. Yeah, if you don't know something, just, I think you should just ask. And you have no problem, there's no problem asking like, well, why is it like that or... Can you, can you give me more history on the background of this? Uh, I'm sure Paula Tucker will, has a big mouth and she will tell you about something, so. All right, well, 
On that note, help me thank our guest, Jeff Bruegel, very much.